Well, precious ones, we've made it so far. Would you open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus? The book of Exodus, chapter 20. We have been preaching in the Ten Commandments. We haven't been following them in strict order. I did one and two. Brother Pete kind of free grazed. And now we come, and today I want us to take on the third commandment. Now I want you to look at me. Exodus, easy book to find, second book in the Old Testament. <clears throat> The Bible is very clear, and I want to be very clear. Keeping the Ten Commandments will not get you to heaven. The commandments are not a proving ground to earn the right to go to heaven. Simply is, as the Bible says, that the commandments of God reflects the glory of God, the holiness of God, what God requires of man. And as the Apostle Paul said, I never would... Come on, look at me. I feel like I'm losing half the folks. As the Apostle Paul said, I never would have known sin without the commandments. And the commandment that broke his heart that God used was covetousness. That's normally the one we never claim. Although our garages are overflowing with stuff that we haven't touched, as my wife is laughing, okay? But I want you to understand, Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. God in the flesh came because only God can do it. And Jesus Christ living a holy, perfect life, died on the cross in payment of my sin debt. So now, say, Brother Dennis, I don't understand how salvation works. Here's how it works. I, a sinner, not by arbitrariness, but by the declared word of God, I am a sinner. I am in need of a Savior. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died in my place, when I call upon Him, asking Him to forgive me and to become my Lord and King. The Bible has a very special word for that. It's called imputed righteousness. That God takes the perfection of Christ and places it over me. My sins are forgiven. And then He does something amazing. You ready? Jeremiah says he writes the word of God in my heart so that now it is my passion to not only do it, but joyfully fulfill the commandments. Amen? So I'm going to tell you something. I'm tell you something sweet, tell you something loving, tell you something hard. If you hate keeping the Ten Commandments, you're going to despise going to heaven. Heaven would feel like hell for you. What I'm trying to tell you very clearly is that you got a big dose of religion, but no salvation. Amen? Every one of us struggles with these things because we have a flesh. But the Bible teaches us, Jesus said, about the commandments. I'm, I'm going back over all of this because if we get this wrong, you're going to look at this as a little boxes to check rather than Christ's likeness to live. Why, do you, why are we even, we're New Testament, why are we dealing with the Old Testament? Because it's all about love. When they asked Jesus, they said, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. I hate to tell you, but that's not part of the ten. It's the reality of the first four, where it's all about Him. It's all about the Lord. And as I grow and I understand these first four commandments, 
I should be growing in my love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Then he said, the second is love your neighbor as yourself. That covers the next six. So what I'm praying is, is we're going to be going through this. That we will grow in our love for the Lord and our love for others around us. Amen? And God will get the glory. So here we are. Go to verse 7. Commandment 3. God says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. God comes. And it's very straightforward. He said there's no getting around it. There's no excuse for it. Won't tolerate it. I'm not going to excuse it away. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The word vain means casual. Almost, almost like throwing away words, like. You notice how people love to say like now? It's like. I said, what did you do yesterday? Well, like we went to the beach. I said, so, okay, you didn't go to the beach. You went to some place that's like the beach. No, no, no. No, we went to the beach. I said, but that's not what you said. You said it's like the beach, like a sand pit in my backyard with the water hose. If we're not careful, we're not mindful of the words we speak and how we speak them. But God cares. And beloved, I want you to take a journey with me. You're going to have to put on your big boy pants. Because this is far more than just using God's as a profanity. Actually, it's way beyond that. You see, how do we take God's name seriously? By making sure we don't take it in an irreverent way. God takes care of His name because it speaks of His person, of His character. I love what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 28, 58. It says, Fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God. He said, man, you should carry respect. This should be a bit of caution that comes into your heart. You ever hear preachers say things silly? For instance, I was about to say like. For instance. Okay? For instance. Listen, if you're mad at God, just tell Him how you feel. Just yell at Him. Just... What verse and what Bible do you read? You mean I can't tell God how I feel? Never forget who you're talking to. You don't get the vomit on God's head. He'll hold your broken heart. He'll understand your struggles. But he won't put up with that. No, sir. I don't know where preachers got that silly talk. Because it's definitely not, the, not biblical. We come, say, Brother Dennis, I, I can't tell God how I feel. God knows exactly how you feel. It's how we approach Him. There's an irreverence in this day that is shocking. It's as though, it's as though not only on the street, but in too many churches across America, we've become a Jerry Springer show. Our behavior, we've lost the ability to blush. We're the people of God. If we don't take God deathbed serious, who will? Now I want you to understand, they're at the foot of the mountain. Thunders and lightnings and all of the awesomeness. 
that God will let them see. You think anybody is going, eh. No. It is a de- it's a scary thing. Why do, why do we, even as believers, I'm not talking, listen, I get it. People who don't know the Lord, don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, weren't raised under a reverence of the name of God, it ain't nothing for them to just profane and curse as though it's just a language. But God says in the book of Jeremiah that there's a judgment on the nation of cursors. Words carry life and death, the book of Proverbs says. But why do we have a tendency to fall into that even after we're saved? Because it all goes with who we were before we got saved. Now I'm going to read you something very unflattering. You ready? But I'm going to tell you now, it's not my opinion. My opinion doesn't matter. The Word of God matters. Amen? The Word of God matters. Look at the Word of God in Romans chapter 3. When God is speaking, having the Apostle Paul write to show that we were all sinners in judgment, both the Jews and the Gentiles, even the blue blood Baptists who think they never had a problem, because I've been at church since my mama was carrying me as a child. Praise God, that's a blessing. But that don't mean that you don't have a sin nature. Watch what the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. This is how God describes us. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of serpents drips from their lips, whose mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Beloved, listen to me. Even after we're saved, if we're not very careful, the Bible reminds us in the book of James that our tongue is set on fire by hell itself. And if we're not careful, our words or destructive. It is a terrible thing. Remember what Jesus said? Out of the abundance of the heart in Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 through 36, He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So I want to tell you, I want to tell you straight, because I love you, because I preached this sermon enough times over the last four decades to know If there's one commandment that Christians just say, I'm good with, this is it. And I'm telling you, we struggle mightily with this commandment. And we need God's grace to do it. And there's a consequence that comes with it. Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the man speaks. Well, I was mad. I got that. But that is like squeezing the tube. Life will always put the squeeze on you. You find out if it's toothpaste or preparation H that comes up. Whatever's in the tube is going to come up. Don't excuse yourself away from that. And I'm going to say very, very gently, but as honest as I can tell you, sir and ma'am, because women curse like sailors today, it's a shameful thing. It's a shameful thing. It's a shocking thing to me. But if you claim to be a born-again believer and you are a habitual swearer, brother, I don't give you half a hallelujah chance of knowing Jesus. You better check your salvation. You better check your salvation. That there's the challenge that comes. There's an irreverence. Taking God's name in vain in a careless way is also blasphemy. We call it profanity. But you know what blasphemy is? Come on, tell me what. Okay? Blasphemy is when you disgrace the name that you're carrying. That I carried the name that I am born again, that I am a child of God, that God is my heavenly Father, I am here. And yet the truth is, you don't stand up to that name. I'm not talking about obedience. I'm talking about, my friend, 
when you're in public, when you're at work, when you're at school, wherever you are, and push comes to shove, as a Christian, you pull down your Jesus banner. You pull down that banner, my friend. You don't stand high as a believer. I'm not talking about being obnoxious. I'm not talking... The Bible says, let your light shine. He's not talking about a high beam halogen flashlight in your eyes. You understand, right? You ever, you ever had a flashlight as a kid? A flashlight will bring out the wickedness in a little boy. It just will. Because he's got this flashlight, and if he's got a sister anywhere close, she's getting it. Right? And when somebody shines you in the eyes with a flashlight, you never say, praise God, please, please, half of this cornea still works. Give it another blast. No, God hasn't called us to be that, but he's called us to let the light and the life that's within us by him to let the world see it. To deliberately not do that, my friend, I am telling you, is blasphemy. You're treating God as irrelevant, as casual. And there's a cost for that. But then there's another one. There's just pure hypocrisy. Jesus warns in Matthew chapter 7. You remember Jesus said this. He says, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, let me into the kingdom of heaven. And I will say, I never knew you. I never knew knew you. And then you're going to say, but didn't we pray in your name? Didn't we do great works in your name? Guys, Jesus' name is not like a little Ouija board power thing. It's a reality of His person in my life. Just because we say at the end of a prayer in Jesus' name doesn't mean we have the authority of His person to pray that. I can't tell you whether you're saved. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus said, many will come to me in that day. Many will come into me in that day. So what do we do with this? Where we are? See, that's, that's just looking at it and taking it seriously and saying, Lord, search me today. Am I, am I lacking in reverence to your name? Have I just become to where... It's just part of my life. Lord, there may be some who are very profane, but mostly we shame and we make God's name vain by blasphemy, by not standing. And the consequence of that is being blinded by our own hypocrisy. So what's the flip side? Every negative in the Bible is God saying, don't hurt yourself. And it has a corresponding positive side. Amen? Anybody ever saw a car battery? All right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if, if you didn't, I'm going to give you an experiment right now. You ready? Because you're going to know whether I'm telling you the truth. Go to your car battery and, and have it unhooked and grab the negative post. Nothing happens. Take your hand off. Grab the positive post. Nothing happens. Then, grab both of them together. It will curl your toe hairs. Amen? You want, you want the commandments to come alive. Understand not only the danger of the negative, but understand the unspoken positive. Man, what does God have for those who will be reverent to His name, respect His name, fear His name? Well, first of all, there'll be tremendous blessings from Almighty God. <clears throat> See, here's what happens. In the Old Testament, every time a name of God was given, when He said, you will, you will not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The word Lord there is Jehovah, Yahweh. Yahweh, the great name of God. It means the covenant-making God. Your God is Elohim. It means this one who's the covenant-making God, who's your God because of who He cared for you, is Almighty God. 
who spoke all things into existence, who we know right now, the Lord Jesus Christ did that. You see, you see, every time God speaks to us, and you're going to be able to see this without being saved. Don't confuse this, all right? One of the names of God in the Old Testament is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. That's in Genesis chapter 22, verse 14. That's when Abraham went to offer Isaac and God provided. Guys, you don't have to be born again to realize that God provides. Amen? There are blessings that He gives. There is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Exodus 15, 26. That when God healed, He said, you're going to call this Jehovah Rapha. They learned that their God heals. There's Jehovah Shalom in Judges 6.24. It means He's the God of peace. Then there's Jehovah Roi. There's many different names throughout the Old Testament. Everyone talked about an action that came from a holy God. Jehovah Roi means the Lord is our shepherd. Psalm 23.1. But there's a new name in the New Testament of God. Jesus gave us that name, and He called Him Father. No one in the Old Testament had called God Father. You see, through the Lord Jesus Christ, I can be saved and adopted into the family of God. Oh, beloved, when we come, this one who's our dad deserves our heart. Deserves our heart. The name that we use now is just Jesus. He was God in the flesh, fully God, fully man. The name Jesus means Jehovah saves. So what does it mean? How do we use this name correctly? You ready? Look, my time is going fast, but I want you to hear me. All right? Are you with me now? Okay, there's three things. The Bible says in Psalm 910, it says, And they that know your name, O God, will put their trust in you. To understand the name of my God is to understand who my God is and what He can do. And there's three things, three things. Write them down and write them big. The first one is found in Micah, Chapter, where did I put it? Micah chapter 4, verse 5. It says, For all people walk in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. What that means is God's name is on me, and wherever I go, it is supposed to be with me. That the name of the Lord comes. What do you find in that? You ready? Number one. If we're going to walk this Christian life, walk. It's kind of tough to run. I'm at the spot where walking is what I love. My prayer is, Lord, let me walk. Let me walk. My day of running. I'm, that's what's so great about getting married young. Beck and I are kind of moving through these stages together. So I got a chance of always catching her. All right? Y'all going to listen later. Okay? But when we walk in the Lord, what do we learn? When we take His name in a solid way, we're going to learn what David learned in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 42 and 45. We come, and the Bible says this, and the Philistine, that's Goliath. The big guy, one eyeball in the middle. No, I'm sorry, that was Cyclops. Okay, y'all with me? Goliath. He comes, and David walks out, and he tells David, come to me, and I'm going to give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear, and with a javelin. 
But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Brother, Christians need to understand that when we walk, we're not arrogant. But I walk as a child of the living God. I come in the name of the Lord. Amen? There is power in that name. And we, we follow that. We're going to honor the Lord. We're going to see that the name of Jesus. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. Number two, there's protection in the name. As I'm walking, I need power, brother. I need power. I need the protection of God. I love what the Bible says, Proverbs 18.10, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. In my life, it's not, I don't run to God when my strength is gone. I run to God for strength. Now, you got to amen that all the way to the back. Because if not, you're going to live this Baptist cycle of, oh, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying, then your life collapses, then it burns out, and then I'm going to rededicate to God, and then you try and try and try, and it crashes again, and you move. Guys, it doesn't have to be like that. Oh, I may fall, but I'm not going to crash, brother. And the God is going to bless and move. Why? Because I find His power, I find His protection, and not only that, I find His provisions. Remember what Jesus said in John 16, verses 23 and 24? He said, whatever you pray, ask the Father in my name. He'll give it to you. Now, I'm not one of those joy boys, shysters on the television. That doesn't mean that God gives you everything you pray for. What He does say is, is what you're asking for, if Jesus Christ can co-sign it, it'll happen. You understand? Somebody ever ask you to co-sign something? Some family member or something? And you don't? How do they take it? Normally not well. Normally not well. Hey, Dad, I've been to four banks. Everyone turned me down. Everybody in the world knows I'm not responsible for this debt. Will you take it and co-sign? I promise, 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 promise. No, I don't think I will. You don't love me. You never cared about me. You ever heard that? You ever said that to God? There's something you really, really want, really, really, really. And I'm not talking about wanting bad things. I'm just talking about wanting some things that you just need to know God's will on. And if it don't happen, you're going to cop an attitude with Almighty God. Brother Dennis, I used to go to church, but in 1989, I got mad at God. Now I'm back. Where you been? How's that worked out for you? I'm glad you're back, but man, that's a bad way to go. Why? Because my God loves me. My God cares for me. My God will do no bad thing for me. So when I come to Him with any prayer, it's always, Lord, if this is right, you sign it. You sign it. I'm going to trust you on that. See, we're to walk in the Lord. Amen? But not only that, we're to wear that name. We're to wear the name of Jesus. You want us to glorify God, you need to wear it. I love what the Bible says in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. It says, Nor is there salvation in any other but Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You know, the world will not... Are you listening? The world will not bother you very much if you say Jesus saved you. But if you say only Jesus saves, now you're going to find that there's going to be a problem. Because everybody follows their God, but not every God is the true God. And so we come... And I need to wear the name of Jesus. I need to let the world know that Jesus saved me. 
and that they need to be saved by Jesus' will and that they can. Amen? Stand up, stand tall in this world. But not only that, we serve in the name of Jesus. Remember what the Bible says in Colossians 3.17. It says, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do, in word or deed, make sure that Jesus can back it up. We're going to minister in the name of Jesus. Oh, it's a terrible thing when people want to minister in the name of Jesus and it's shameful and it's sinful. I thought you were a Christian. Well, I am a Christian. Well, I don't know who taught you, taught you that. Hey, you ever came to church, sat down, and what you're doing is thinking whether you agree with me or not? You know that's that's the wrong approach, right? Because you can agree with me and we could both be wrong. What matters is if I agree with the Word of God and you agree with the Word of God. Because only the Word of God is eternal. We serve the Lord in the name of Jesus. We come. But not only that, we need to walk in that name. You want to do it right? You need to walk. Let the Lord live through you. He'll give you the power. He'll protect you. He'll give you the provisions. But not only that, you need to wear and don't hide. But not the last one. We need to be worthy of that name. You remember what the Bible said in Acts chapter, chapter 11, verse 26? Brother Dennis, why do you... Quote so many scriptures so I don't have to tell you my opinions. A preacher that don't quote the scriptures, what's he talking about? That gets scary quick. But in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, here's what the Bible says. That, the, that they were first called Christians at Antioch. Jesus didn't name them Christians. The people named them Christians because they could see he would spend time with Jesus. Amen? So what are we supposed to do with this message? What are we supposed to do with this? As Beck comes to make her way? Well, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.19, come on up, Vic. In 2 Timothy 2.19, listen to this. Because in a moment, we're going to stand. And it's decision time. Every message has a decision to render. In 2 Timothy 2.19, the Bible says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. Amen? We're on speaking terms with God. And number two, let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You got that? What a Christian supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Walk away from your sin. Walk away from your sin. Like one lady who was a mighty big gossip in the church. She came forward one time. They had one of those churches with the big circular altar. She came forward, she said, Oh, pastor, pastor, I've got an evil tongue. I need to surrender to God. He said, well, ma'am, this altar's 20 foot long. Put as much of your tongue on it as you can. Some of these sins go deep. The sin of... This sin goes far deeper than we ever thought. And so as we come and Brother Pete makes his way, there's one last verse I want you to read. Will you let me? Then I'm going to ask you to give us a little bit more time.
so we can have an invitation and let the Spirit of God move. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, listen to this verse. It said, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Those who feared the Lord, reverenced His name, spoke one to another. And the Lord, got it? Listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before the Lord for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on His name. Jesus said, every idle word we speak, we're going to give an account to God. God says, you want your worship to transform? Y'all start talking among yourselves about me. About how I've answered prayer, how I've helped you. And God says, I'm going to listen. And even better than that, you know what he said? He said, I'm writing it down. I'm writing it down. See, there's more than three, but I'll name you three books right now that God's written. One is the Bible, as the book of Revelation. Not just the end book, the whole thing is a revelation of God. The other one is the book of redemption. That the Bible says that those who have called on to Christ, their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That can be written today. If you will believe in your heart and call upon, they who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We do it publicly. With the heart is private, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's not Brother Dennis's idea. That's God's word, Romans chapter 10. So in a moment, we're going to stand. Beck is going to begin singing a cappella. That means with no additional music. I've decided to follow Jesus. That's all you call to do today before God. Personally. If today is the day you know you need to surrender to Christ as your Lord and Savior, then when we stand and sing, I invite you to come to Brother Pete. Say, today I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. And then there's one last one. A book of remembrance. I just want to ask you this. Is everybody with me? Open your eyes. This past week in your life, you claim to be born again. I'm a follower of Jesus. What did God write about you? Not about the wrongs you did. He says, they would talk about me. What would God have written? When my mom passed at 88, I went through her little possessions. And she saved every letter I had ever sent her. She had saved them. And that moved my heart. But when I saw how small the stack was, it broke my heart. Wonder how much God wrote from hearing me. The good thing is we can change that. Because we have a forgiving God.